Hi folks, in this video we're going to talk about DC motors. We're going to introduce them first and then talk about the components of the DC motor. And then in a second video we will talk about the basic operation of a DC motor. So let's start with a history lesson. Faraday started by demonstrating that a magnetic field exists around a current carrying wire. And so this experiment on the left, you can see that there is a cylindrical sort of uh, contraption here, and that's in this case essentially a battery. It's, it's generating a, a voltage. And so the current then goes th up through the wire, if my pen will draw, there we go, up through the wire, uh, and to this uh, wire that's anchored at the top, and down to a uh, jar of, of mercury. And so the mercury allows a current to flow then uh, wherever the wire ends up being. So the wire is going to move in this, in this mercury. And what's going to cause it to move is a permanent magnet. And so what Faraday showed is that when there is current going through the wire, the wire moves away from the permanent magnet. There's, there's a magnetic field generated there as well. And if he reversed the polarity of the magnet, he could show that it came towards the magnet instead. So uh, Faraday demonstrated that there's a magnetic field. And so Henry, in 31, then uh, demonstrated that this could be translated into motion. And so there's a rocker here. You can see that this, this uh, piece on top of the rocker is wound with wires. And so there's a permanent magnet on each side and there's two batteries, and so as it rocks back and forth, it makes contact with one of the batteries, which energizes the coil, and then generates a magnetic field, courtesy of Faraday, that repels from the permanent magnet that's sitting there. And so that repelling is going to force the rocker the other way, so that it loses the first contact and makes contact on the other side, and it just bounces back and forth. And it happens to bounce back and forth at about 75 hertz. But that's still not particularly useful for us. What we really want is rotary motion. And so Sturgeon, in, in 1832, the next year, developed a commutator. We're going to talk a little bit about commutators. But the commutator acts like this rocking motion that it's going to switch the direction of the current back and forth in the coil. And that switching back and forth is going to cause the... Um, the magnetic field to change, and the magnetic field is going to change relative to these uh, permanent magnets, which is going to cause a torque to be generated on the current carrying wire, and it's going to rotate. So that is our commutator and our first rotary electric motor in 1832. So where do we go from there? Well, modern DC motors are going to be a little different in construction, and I'll show you why, uh, but they're still very simple in operation. If you put in a higher voltage, you generate a higher speed. If you reverse the direction of the voltage, you, you just flip the, uh, the contacts there, it turns the other direction. And so that operation maintains today, and that is a great way to do things. So essentially, DC motors are going to give us speed control. If you want to do position control, you might use a stepper motor, or you might wrap feedback around your DC motor to make it a servo motor. So higher voltage, higher speed, reverse voltage, reverse direction. How do we model this? Well, we're going to have an armature, which is our coils of wire, and there's going to be current flowing through the armature, and as that current flows the, through the armature, then it's going to interact with the magnetic field, which is not shown in the, uh, the typical model, but, but here it is, there's our field, and as it moves through the field, that's going to generate a torque. So the current carrying conductor induces a force, which is going to be at a distance, so it's going to be torque. And there's also going to be back EMF, so that as it moves through the field, it will generate a, a voltage in the armature. And we will see that as well. So we can do this with two different ways. We can control either the voltage or the current. If we control the voltage, then we get that first m method of operation that I mentioned, which is velocity control, speed control. Uh, and if we control the current, then instead we're going to control the torque. Uh, so if we can control the current through the windings, we'll get the, the torque control. Why would we want to do that? Well, there's some, some different applications. Mostly what we're going to look at in this class is going to be speed control, though. Just so you know, there are two options. So this is what a standard, cheap, commercial, brushed, permanent magnet DC motor looks like today. Uh, and I say cheap, this is all of three bucks each. So we've got our major elements that are going to be the same regardless of which one we're dealing with. We have a rotor. You can see the, the shaft sticking out there 
We have a stator, which is the stationary portion that doesn't rotate, and we've got our contacts. And so internally, there's going to be the commutator, which is going to control the, the direction of the current through the windings, and there's going to be the windings as well. But these are the things you're going to see on the outside. You apply a voltage to the contacts, you hold the stator stationary, and the rotor is going to spin. And like I said, these get really cheap. Now, the really cheap ones are going to be very cheap in operation, too. You, you get what you pay for. Uh, but they're all going to behave about the same way, depending on, on uh, how they're constructed. So like I mentioned, the rotor is the rotating part, and, and this is a cutaway on the left. Uh, so in there in the middle, that rotating part is called the rotor. The stator is the part that doesn't move. It's the stationary part on the outside. The field system is how we're going to generate the magnetic flux, because it, it has to move within a field. So how do we generate it? Is it going to be an electromagnet? Is it going to be a permanent magnet? Remember that the, uh, the historic examples I showed you were permanent magnets. That's certainly one way to go. You could make an electromagnet, though. We've got the armature, which is the part carrying the current. That's going to be our, current, our windings in there. And we've got our brushes, and the brushes are how we get the current from the contacts on the outside to the windings on the inside. So it's going to go through the brushes, and the brushes interact with what we call the commutator. So the brushes rub up against the commutator. The commutator allows the current direction to be switching back and forth, depending on how the windings are. Uh, and that's going to get the current into the armature, which interacts then with the field. So the rotor, as I mentioned, is the rotating portion of the DC motor. So this is one example in the, in the left side picture here. You can see that we've got a bunch of coils of copper wire there. There's actually three. This is what we might call lap winding. And then here's another example, and I'll show you why this looks a little different. And you can see that we can make a different length. This one is, is longer um, in the direction of the rotor versus this one you can see is very short in the direction of the rotor. And it depends on what you're trying to get out of it. it depends how you're going to design it. But the big thing is that this is where the coils of wire are going to be. And so the coils of wire can be either lap or wave wound. In lap winding, there's going to be however many um, parallel current paths, and that's our number of poles. And in wave winding, we've only got two, and they're going to be much more complicated paths. So on the right, this is wave winding. So that one's wave winding. And back here, this one here is lap winding. So three parallel paths in this case, two parallel paths in this case. Uh, and it, it depends on how you're going to use it again, because if you've got... Um, Several parallel paths, you're going to have high current, low voltage motors, and if you've got the wave winding, you're going to have high voltage. Um, I reversed that, sorry. High current, low voltage for lap, high voltage, low current for wave. And it makes sense, it's going to depend on the, the wire choice you use and, and how much wire you're going to have, and it's going to depend on your resistive heating. So that's the windings. The stator is the stationary part, and in this case, this has got permanent magnets. This is uh, a relatively cheap one that's just had the rotor removed. So we've got two permanent magnets in there. Uh, and then the brushes are going to transmit the current from the stator to the rotor. That's what I mentioned before. So in this case, this whole thing here, this is a carbon brush, is going to press up against the commutator, which is the rotary part in the middle. Notice that you can see in here, this is wave winding. Uh, we might have other forms of brushes. Over on the right-hand side, we've got a really cheap brush. You notice that this one is uh, not using a, a carbon piece like, like these other two pictures that's going to wear away. Instead, it's just got these two uh, metal prongs that press in there, and it's, it's based on treating them as springs. Now, the problem with the carbon ones is as they wear down, they're going to have carbon dust fill up your motor. But on the other hand, you can take them out, replace them, clean out the motor, and it'll work again. For the really cheap ones, when those brushes are bent or damaged, they're done. Now, this also, as you can see, is going to have intermittent contact, and so it's going to be your failure source typically. It's going to be the thing that's going to wear out. It's going to be the thing that's going to generate electrical noise. It's not a, a perfect component. Uh, it is what we call failure prone. And it may be spring driven in order to press it against the commutator, but there's still some bounce there, which is where you start getting failures. So how does the commutator actually work? Well, it's going to act as a switch. It's a mechanical switch instead of like a transistor where we've seen that it's an electrical switch. And so it's going to allow the brushes to make contact with different 
elements on the outside here, which is going to give us different current flows. So if you think about your wave winding, there's two paths that the current can take. And so as this commutator rotates relative to the brushes, different contacts on the outside, we've got all these different contacts on the outside, different ones of those are going to make contact with the brushes at any given path, any given time. And so that will give us a path for the current from one brush through all the windings out to the other brush. And so as it rotates, then it's going to reverse the direction. And it's just going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, which is going to make sure that we are continuously rotating the motor. Uh, so in a lap winding, it's going to take one, it's going to take the current out of one and put it into another. So if we put those together, we get a, in this case, very small DC motor. Um, this is just a slightly different design. Notice this is the commutator. It's got several distinct contact points there. Uh, I only count five. And then we've got our brushes. And if we put this all together with a stator and some permanent magnets, we should get some motion. So that's our elements of our DC motor. That's what they look like. I am going to stop the video here. And we will start again with how it works in an equation sense.